Uh, I'm very honored today to have Dr. Robert Williams with us. I will leave my colleague Milan Pizari to introduce him and to moderate him, but I just have to say that this is really an honor for the Institute to have you with us. It's also an honor for our community. I think that uh, your work is very uh, distinguished in this area, and we really hope that uh, uh, there will be more occasions to see you here. The Institute is uh, one, I would say, particular house which is uh, having uh, as its research unit Shoah Lab, which is a research unit for researching Holocaust, uh, uh, basically. So this is a really good uh, chance to have to have you with us, and this is, uh, as I said, particular institution which is in this region, basically the only one who is trying to establish uh, Holocaust and genocide studies. Uh, so I hope that definitely we are going to see each other uh, around. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now introduce you. Uh, it's also for me uh, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Dr. Robert Williams is Deputy Director for the International Life Paris at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum on the steering committee of the Global Task Force Against the Holocaust Distortion, and served for four years as chair of the Committee on Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. He has played several leadership roles in international initiatives focused on Holocaust and antisemitism issues, and regularly advises international organizations and governments on these matters. In addition, Robert is currently overseeing a major program that assists European Holocaust and genocide denial laws. Robert's research specialties is include German history, the US and Russian foreign policy, propaganda and disinformation, and contemporary antisemitism. He is currently co-editing a volume for Rutledge on the history of antisemitism and preparing a separate monograph on antisemitism and politics. So Robert, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone for actually uh, asking me to speak today. It's actually my honor and pleasure to join you here at the Shoah Lab at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. It is really actually a very remarkable and unique institution. Uh, so outside of Serbia, because there are rather unique benefits to your country when it comes to this issue, but outside of Serbia in many European countries, as well as in my home country, the United States and North America at large, one of the primary factors that led to the Holocaust, namely anti-Semitism, is something that seems to be on the rise. So I'm gonna talk for about 30 to 40 minutes about this issue. I'm gonna be somewhat broad, but if nothing else, I want you to walk away from our discussion today remembering a few key things. Assuming it works, hold on, there we go. Um, just a little slow. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. First, anti-Semitism is not something that disappears. Anti-Semitism has been with us for a long time. It continues to grow. It continues to adapt. And therefore, it's a persistent form of hatred that we need to engage with. Contrary to popular culture, anti-Semitism is not unique to any one religion, any one people, any one culture. It has multiple influences Influences that range from white nationalism, neo-Nazism, fascism, communism, anti-Zionism, anti-globalism, sometimes anti-Americanism, and other forms of thought, some legitimate, some not. Contrary to popular belief as well, there we go, uh, it's sometimes difficult to identify anti-Semitism. It can be staring you in the face and you might not recognize it. This is a challenge that's made even more difficult by the fact that anti-Semitism will engage with and sometimes appear in other forms of hatred and bias. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Fourth, anti-Semitism okay. uh, and some related phenomena like Holocaust denial or distortion of history are real threats to our core institutions, to our shared international beliefs and to the stability of our countries whether they are established democracies or newer democratic regimes. Now, these are all four very pessimistic points that I want you to walk away with. Let me give you something positive. Maybe, there we go. Anti-Semitism is a belief system at the end of the day. Like any belief system, it can be changed, but change doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it takes generations, but more important than that, it takes 
direct engagement with the facts of what you are dealing with, a willingness to engage with anti-Semitism in a way that is free of our passions, and a willingness to engage together in a common struggle. All right. I can tell this is going to drive me nuts, so eventually I'll start clenching my teeth. It's not you. It's definitely just me being Ooh. impatient. All right. Let's begin with a general history of the phenomenon. Anti-Semitism, as many of you know, is something that's been with us for centuries. Now, there are some scholars who will start the tale of anti-Semitism with Nebuchadnezzar and, the, and Babylon. Yeah, I don't think that's really too appropriate. I think we can start the long history of anti-Semitism with the Roman conquest of Jerusalem, certainly with the foundations of the Catholic Church of Rome in the fourth and fifth centuries. And as Jews became increasingly identified as a political and theological other in post-Roman Europe, based on the belief that Judaism had been superseded by Christianity, the Jewish people became subject to various forms of discrimination and mistreatment. Now, this was not a linear path. Mistreatment of Jewish communities varied from time to time, from place to place. So under the Merovingian and Carolingian dynasties of, uh, in France, Jews were reasonably well tolerated. After Jews were expelled from most of Western Europe into Eastern Europe at the time of the First Crusade, they were welcomed with relatively open arms in Poland, although that certainly changed as well. But this history of the expulsion of Jews ultimately dictated their fate. The most notorious case of the expulsion of Jews did not happen in continental Europe. It actually happened in Great Britain, when in the 13th century, King Edward I, after he taxed them to the state of poverty and hanged hundreds in order to set an example, he expelled Jews from Britain. Jews were not allowed back into Great Britain until 1656, and that set the tone for what became a, gen a general degradation of treatment of Jewish communities across Europe. Things began, began e to get even worse by the period of the Spanish Inquisition of the late 15th century. As some of you may know, in 1492, the Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, used the Inquisition to cast doubt on communities uh, in newly unified Spain. These communities, of course, included Jews and Muslims, but also Jews and Muslims who had converted to Christianity. These persons were condemned, tortured, or murdered because the church did not believe in the veracity of their conversion. Some scholars will argue that this is the birth of what we could call racialized anti-Semitism, that is, belief in an unchanging nature that makes one human group different from another, but I'm not sure that's the case. I think in many ways the anti-Semitism or the Ju Judeophobia that we saw during the period of Inquisition was consistent with earlier religious-based forms that had an out in the case of religious conversion. I think if we're going to look at the development of racial anti-Semitism, please work, there we go, we need to actually begin with the period of the Enlightenment. So there's a certain tension here. The Enlightenment is the period that led to our understanding of certain core features of the modern age, features like universal liberty, human dignity, democracy, and so on. It also led to the forms of thinking necessary to bring about the great scientific and industrial revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. But there's an old American expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch, because at the same time that these developments came out, so too did the development of a belief in national identities, that is, those imagined lines that distinguish one community from another, as well as a rise in scientific thought, which, when misinterpreted, led to the belief in something called racial sciences, pseudoscientific thought that sought to argue that we were incompatible with one another. At the same time that racialized forms of distinction were emerging, so too was the rise of conspiracy thinking, something we'll go into much more detail in a little bit, because it became less clear in post-monarchical societies who was responsible for problems. You see, if crop yields weren't good in the old regime, you knew who to blame. It was the king. It was the queen. In a democracy, blame for civil strife becomes a little more diffuse. You don't quite know where it is, who's responsible, what is to blame for your misfortune. So you begin looking for scapegoats. As you're looking for scapegoats, that led to 
a desire to find, I'm not quite sure whose phone that is, but uh, a desire to, to fall back on old tropes and old hatreds. One of the most long lasting, of course, was identifying Jews with that misfortune. This era that combined conspiracy thinking, racialized pseudoscience, and the belief in imagined communities of others led to the rise of what we would call today anti-Semitism. Indeed, the term anti-Semitism itself was popularized by a German journalist named Wilhelm Marr uh, in the late 19th century, actually in the book that is on the far right-hand side. Marr uh, made use of the term anti-Semitism as a point of pride. He saw the hatred of Jews as something that was rational within his own particular worldview. And this form of hatred um, is, of course, the one that led to the Holocaust. The third form of anti-Semitism, there we go, wasn't necessarily born in Europe, but it had some European roots. Since the late 1990s, in some countries, there's been a steady increase in forms of anti-Semitism that manifest through criticism of the state of Israel. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that you cannot criticize Israel. There are legitimate grounds to comment on any state's policies. But it's clear that at times, anti-Israel rhetoric will cross the line from being legitimate forms of criticism to forms of criticism that traffic in anti-Semitic tropes. Now, this new form of anti-Semitism perpetuates some of the old myths, like conspiracy or the myth that Jews is the eternal outsider. But it also has distinct features that are tied to anti-Zionism, anti-globalism. And it's also interesting to note that the proponents of this newer form of anti-Semitism often differ from one another in terms of their ideological worldviews. So in the Middle East, it's more often found among extremist Muslim clerics and in Western countries among extreme leftist intellectuals, people who would otherwise have nothing to do with one another agreeing on a common theme, at least vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Most of these proponents, whether they're Muslim clerics or leftist intellectuals, also seem to be relatively unaware of the Soviet roots of this form of anti-Semitism. You see, this form of anti-Semitism, although it became popular in the 1990s, really began in the 1970s through specific Soviet programs that were targeted at international Jewish communities and at the state of Israel. The Soviets even had an anti-Zionist com uh, committee for the Soviet public that would organize campaigns in order to undermine support for Israel. These campaigns used a lot of the themes and imagery that we continue to see today in a number of uh, Western countries. All right, that's your history lesson. Let's talk about today. Now, I'm gonna start in my home country, not because it's the site at which anti-Semitism was born, but it has become a country where anti-Semitism has begun to rear its ugly head in unforeseen ways. Now, we used to assume in the United States that we were somewhat exceptional because the anti-Semitism, the violent forms at least, of anti-Semitism that were seen in European history were relatively absent on my side of the world. Now, there were some incidents. In 1862, in my home state of Kentucky, during our Civil War, one of the Northern generals, later became a president of the United States, did try to kick Jews out of the state of Kentucky. It didn't ultimately succeed. In 1915, at the height of the scourge of lynchings that took place across my country that claimed the lives of thousands of African Americans, a Jewish man named Leo Frank was lynched in the state of Marietta, Georgia. But attacks on Jews were relatively focused on rhetoric concerns that Jews were infecting society rather than attacking them. So um, this image, for example, comes from a late 19th century popular publication warning readers that the city of New York would soon become New Jerusalem due to the waves of Jewish immigrants who came to the United States after Tsarist pogroms began in the 1870s. Rhetoric continued to escalate really until about the 1950s when rhetoric began to turn into violent action. So between, come on. I might need somebody to just click the button for me. I apologize, because this doesn't seem to have the range. All right, so between 1957 and 1958, there's sometimes, there's sometimes a map that comes up. There we go. Uh, between 1957 and 1958, there were at least eight actual or attempted bombings of Jewish institutions 
in the United States at the start of our civil rights era. In March 1960, a 16-year-old child threw a Molotov cocktail through a synagogue window in the uh, state of Alabama. Now, the, co the bomb didn't explode, but the people inside the congregation ran out, allowing this kid an opportunity to shoot the congregants as they fled. He wounded two. Th such things only became more common over the course of the 1960s. By the 1970s, they moved from the southern part of the United States to the north, uh, including in uh, parts of Washington, D.C. By the 1980s, things began to quiet down, fortunately. But 1991 saw um, the rise of attacks from other communities. So in Crown Heights, New York, for example, uh, there was a riot against the Jewish community there that led to some uh, violent actions. On the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, one of our more famous landmarks, a group of Jewish students were uh, shot while riding in a uh, van. And then there were attacks in California, in the state of Oregon, in Los Angeles, and where I happened to be living at the time, in Chicago. Today, uh, I think the next one. Okay, thank you, sorry. I have animations too that make it harder. Today we're witnessing an escalation of all of this in the United States, uh, particularly in the form of deadly shooting attacks at Jewish community institutions. This really began in 2014 in the state of Kansas, and since then, one community after another have been subject to everything from graffiti to violent assaults to shooting deaths. And if you look at these incidents, you see something that I want to emphasize. You see, the attackers do not just come from the extreme right. There are very few that come from the extreme left, but there are some that come from certain religious ideologies, both Christian and Muslim, as well as from other minority communities in the United States. What I'm trying to emphasize is that these people are different, but they're only bound by one common thing, a shared hatred of Jews. In 2020, the Federal Bureau of Investigation determined that crimes against Jews represented 58% of all religious-based hate crimes, which is how we can track anti-Semitism in the States. This was a slight drop from 2019 when there were 60% uh, of these crimes, but this slight decline has nothing to do with less anti-Semitism and more to do with the fact of COVID-induced lockdowns and an inability to deal with online anti-Semitism. Plus, we have a problem with police in the United States not reporting these crimes. I'll just cut to the chase. We have 15,588 law enforcement agencies in the United States, police departments. Of these 15,588 police departments in 2019, only 2,172 sent hate crime reports of any kind to the FBI. So there are huge gaps in reporting in my home country. But things in Europe, next slide please, are not much better. Um, as I said a moment ago, for all intents and purposes, anti-Semitism began in Europe, which makes European anti-Semitism a particularly pernicious problem. Surveys within the European Union demonstrate this best. 89% of Jews in the EU believe anti-Semitism has increased in their home countries. 20% have family members or friends who have been subject to physical or verbal assaults. And most disturbing, or most shocking, at least for American audiences, 79.2% will not go to the police to report these crimes in the first place most often uh, saying that they don't think it will change anything if they do. But even if you look at police statistics, you see something quite frightening. I want you to, well, let's take the 10 years between 2010 and 2020. If you look at official police statistics as sent to the fundamental rights agency of the EU, you will see that in some European countries, anti-Semitism fell. These countries included the Czech Republic and surprisingly France. France, the decline has happened mostly in 2019 and 2020. But in most EU countries, anti-Semitism increased, with some countries like Denmark or Romania having rates of increase over that 10-year period that exceeded 100%. And this is not just a problem of small or medium-sized countries. And the one EU country that I would argue takes anti-Semitism most seriously, Germany, there was an 85% increase over that 10 year period. Uh, oh, sorry, well, 85.4, all right. So I, I'm not that far off with my memory. And the fifth consecutive year of an increase in this particular form of hatred. And again, this is in the country that takes this issue the most seriously. 
And these statistics in the European context are still only the tip of the iceberg due to the different ways that the police, the judiciary, or state governments report these crimes. And most frightening of all is what I told you earlier. You have to remember that these statistics show a rise and we still know that about 79% of people don't go to the police in the first place to report these crimes. Uh, next slide, please. I also wanna emphasize that it's important to remember that most anti-Semites don't restrict their hatred just to Jews. In the European context, we see anti-Semitic themes applied to non-Jewish audiences from time to time, particularly to Muslim audiences or to Muslim communities and to Roma communities. Now, I'm not saying that anti-Roma racism or Islamophobia are the same as anti-Semitism. They're not. Each has their own particular context, their own particular history, and their own forms of expression. But at times, they will overlap. So I want to demonstrate this. Here, on the left-hand side of the screen, we have the cover of a notorious Nazi publication. And you'll see a an anti-Semitic caricature of a Jew about to attack a Nazi woman. You can't quite see it, but she's wearing a little swastika jewel on her, on her collar. So that's from 1937. On the right hand side, we have a right of center popular magazine from Poland that came out in 2016. Here you see men with brown skin attacking a blonde woman wearing an EU flag. And for those of you who know Polish, you can read that the headline is the Islamic rape of Europe. You have different themes, different contexts, or sorry, different times, different contexts, but very similar forms of hate being applied across a chronological spectrum. Next slide, please. So now we have a sense of how anti-Semitism affects day-to-day -day life, but we haven't actually said what anti-Semitism is. Most people will use a, I'll know it when I see it approach to anti-Semitism. And this can work if you've been the victim of an anti-Semitic attack yourself, or if you've maintained some awareness of these issues. But the vast majority of us don't think of anti-Semitism, don't really know what it is, and need a resource in order to understand it if we are ever going to push back. So about six years ago, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, of which Serbia is an important member, passed a non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism that's been endorsed by more than 35 governments as of today, as well as received, including your own, as well as received positive reference by the European Union, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, major sports leagues, the Bundesliga and the Premier League have adopted it, for example. And in my country, it's been used by three successive <coughs> presidential administrations, uh, Obama, Trump, and Biden. And for those three to agree on something, you well, it's rather remarkable, isn't it? Um, next slide, please. At its core, the definition states that anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. Now I want you to look at this closely for a moment and see what's not there. It doesn't tell you who's a Jew. It doesn't tell you who's an anti-Semite and it doesn't even say what motivates anti-Semitism. Instead, it really says anti-Semitism appears in certain ways. And this is an important distinction because it get, this tool is ultimately an education tool. It's an opportunity to teach people about anti-Semitism. Instead of going up to somebody, pointing your finger at them and saying, you're an anti-Semite, which will immediately erect a psychological barrier to learning. Using this definition allows you to say, you know, that image, that might be anti-Semitic, or what you just said, that might be problematic. Let's talk about it. Now, to supplement this admittedly very broad definition, the IRA resource also includes 11 examples of some of the ways that anti-Semitism appears. We're not going to go into all of them. Let's go into a couple just to give you an illustration of this. Next slide, please. So one of the most obvious forms is calling for the murder of Jews in service to an extreme ideology. This is probably what most of us would think of when we hear the word anti-Semitism. Next slide, please. Another more common form is accusing Jews for real or imagined wrongdoings. How can this work? I'm going to give you another little history lesson. This is a picture of Herschel Grinspan. Now, this was taken in November of 1938. Now, at the time, Grinspan was one of about 50,000 German Jewish refugees living in France uh, he had fled Nazi Germany. 
earlier, before this picture was taken, he had learned that his parents, who were born in Poland, had been deported back to Poland by Nazi authorities. So alone and angry in a country where he was not welcome, the French weren't exactly welcoming then either, he decided to commit a crime. He went to the German embassy in Paris and murdered an, an embassy official. Now, the Nazis used this crime as a pretext to launch the Kristallnacht pogrom of 9 to 10 November 1938. Now, would the Nazis have carried out this violent action against the Jews of Germany and Austria if Grinspan had not committed his crime? Yes, absolutely. But by pinning these actions on the notion of revenge for the murder of a German, they were able to build a justification for their crimes and popular support. Uh, next slide, please. As I said earlier, anti-Israel criticism can also be a form of anti-Semitism. Uh, I want to be clear again, nobody's saying that you cannot criticize Israel. The IRA working definition states quite clearly, quote, criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic, end quote. But sometimes criticism crosses an anti-Semitic line. So this is a picture of the synagogue in Wuppertal, Germany. In 2014, it was firebombed. Now, the arsonist behind this attack, when arrested, said that they threw Molotov cocktails at this synagogue because they were protesting Israeli policies in Gaza. But they didn't attack an Israeli institution like a consulate. They attacked a local Jewish community institution because they conflated all Jews with Israel and then decided to carry out their crime. Um, next slide, or just click. We're going to skip over this for the sake of time. And we're going to move to, uh, yeah, we skipped that. And all right, so now we have a sense of some of the general trends. Um, but what's behind the rise in anti-Semitism? There are more hate groups across the world, that's for sure. And there's more of an unwillingness to be uncivil in public. There are also indicators that more and more people are believing in certain forms of conspiracy myth. So what is a conspiracy myth? Well, this is tricky because there are actually real conspiracies just as there are conspiracy theories. What's the difference? A real conspiracy, well, a surprise party planned for you by your friends, that can be a conspiracy, right? A bank heist, technically a conspiracy. The planning of genocides can be a conspiracy, the planning of the Rwandan genocide, for example. But these conspiracies, these actual conspiracies, were organized by small groups who leave behind enough evidence to prove their crimes, often after the fact. A conspiracy theory is the claim that there's a real conspiracy, but no evidence and often no logic. And a number of these conspiracy theories or conspiracy myths are actually anti-Semitic. Two of the oldest anti-Semitic conspiracy myths are reflected here. One is the so-called blood libel. Now, for those of you who do not know this one, it is the claim that Jews will murder non-Jews to use their blood, often in the preparation of matzah. Um, this conspiracy myth emerged in Great Britain uh, in the 12th century around tales surrounding the death of St. William of Norwich. It then moved to continental Europe, popping up from time to time during the period of the Middle Ages and early modern era. By the early 19th century, it made its way to the Middle East and then reappeared again in Europe in the late Russian Empire uh, by the end of the uh, 19th century. A more modern conspiracy theory has proven even more influential. This is something called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Oh, sorry, if you could go back one slide. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, kind of reflected on the bottom there. Um, for those who do, you probably heard of this conspiracy myth, but may not know the contents. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion are a forgery, a fake book that claim to be the plans of a secret group of Jews plotting to take over the world by controlling the economy, controlling the media, controlling political parties, a lot of the anti-Semitic themes that we're familiar with. Now, I said this book is a forgery, and it is. The short version is, in the late 1890s, Russian secret police, the Okhrana, working in Paris, uh, took elements of several other books to invent a conspiracy theory focused exclusively on Jews. Why Jews? Because they wanted to play on the emotions of the anti-Semitic Russian czar Nicholas II in order to convince him 
not to modernize Russia's economy, Russia's politics, or Russia's industry. It's starting to sound familiar, right? Um, these protocols were ultimately published in 1905 uh, and then translated out of Russian by 1920. And they spread across the world very quickly soon thereafter, oftentimes because they had the endorsement of political or financial elites. So in my home country, the protocols became very popular reading because Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company, republished these weekly in his uh, own newspaper. This conspiracy continues to be influential. Next slide, please. And both of these are popping up in some of the more common conspiracy theories we are facing today. One of these is a so-called great replacement conspiracy theory, something that's been repopularized by certain French writers. It's a claim that native white Europeans uh, or white European Americans in my country's case are being replaced by non-whites from Africa, the Middle East or Latin America and that Jews are behind this replacement in order to undermine Western moralities and to take over the world. These ideas have been picked up by the far right on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, if you could click, please. Um, and here, oh, sorry, one more click, sorry. So here, for example, is Marine Le Pen, the leader of the far right party in France. The book on the top left that circled behind her is one of the central tracks of the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory. You can see that she's displaying it as a message to other extremists around her. Um, sometimes extremists who believe this, click please. Thank you. Um, we'll also make anti-Semitic references to individuals like the philanthropist George Soros or chance slogans like the Jews will not replace us, something that has been heard most prominently in my country during far-right rallies like the one that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. This conspiracy myth is quite overtly anti-Semitic. Uh, next slide, please. And so is uh, QAnon or QAnon. Um, you might not know, QAnon first emerged online in 2017. It's a super conspiracy in that it takes elements of other conspiracy myths into its overall message. And what is that message? Well, at its core, QAnon asserts that there is a secret Jewish government that includes George Soros or the Rothschilds or certain non-Jews, including sometimes the Saudi royal family, for fun, um, who are in league with Satanists in order to take over the world and that they're achieving their plans by controlling the media, controlling the economy, controlling politics, and at the same time are abusing and murdering children in order to get their blood to create a compound called adrenochrome. In essence, the same elements that you see in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and the Blood Bible. And although QAnon is perhaps the worst cultural export of the United States, it's no longer been restricted just to the United States. QAnon has achieved some popularity in a number of countries in Europe, including former Yugoslav countries, in Germany, the picture on the bottom is actually from Berlin last year. Uh, in the UK, actually, especially in the UK, uh, the Netherlands, parts of France, and now even outside of Europe in countries like Japan. And next slide, please. Just as QAnon benefit from the COVID pandemic, so have other forms of anti-Semitism. There are about nine different types of anti-Semitism associated with the pandemic now. These include claims that Jews created the virus, that they're responsible for its spread, that they profit from COVID-19, that they enjoy when non-Jews die of COVID. Thank you. There are some people saying the pandemic proves the Holocaust never happened. Uh, there are religious leaders of both Christian and Muslim faiths predominantly saying that the pandemic is God's punishment for tolerating Jews. Now that there are vaccines, there are of course people saying Jews use the vaccines to take control again and again is reflected well here on the top right but also elsewhere we see people using symbols from the holocaust as they protest pandemic responses and the ninth form is different from this actually the ninth form of covid related anti-semitism is something that we've seen mostly in american far-right chat rooms and in hungarian far-right chat rooms but claims that extremists will try to use the virus to intentionally infect people in order to make them sick and die. Um, yeah, well, that's depressing enough. Let's move on to the next slide. So um, these conspiracy theories also work in, in ways online that are worth mentioning. 
A scholar at Rutgers University named Joel Finkelstein has found, for example, that anti-Semitic content directed at certain Jewish individuals, like George Soros, showed significant peaks on various online for, in various online fora like 4chan, Gab, and Reddit uh, during the 2017 inauguration of Donald Trump and prior to the Charlottesville far-right rally in 2017. A number of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, memes also uh, appeared in the days leading up to the mass shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2019. These themes suggested that Jews were importing migrants into the United States in order to undermine our, our country. Uh, the perpetrator of this attack, a man by the name of Robert Bowers, posted a statement on the online forum Gab saying that HIAS, this is a Jewish organization that helps migrants, is bringing invaders to kill our country. I can't stand by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. He then murdered 11 people at that synagogue and injured six others. In short, there are indications that extremists traffic in anti-Semitic content prior to and during intense moments of social stress and or terror attacks, something that more and more specialists in anti-terror studies are, are trying to track. Uh, next slide, please. This brings me to the fact that we can't escape the reality that online media has also had an effect on anti-Semitism. According to the Anti-Defamation League, 49% of Americans were harassed online last year. Of these, 36% were Jews, which was an increase. And since we spent the better part of the last two years living on these, I think we can expect online forms of anti-Semitism to only increase in the coming years. But how do extreme online communities work? In terms of practice, online anti-Semitism and other forms of hate speech create a sense of community between already extreme people, while at the same time attracting new adherents. These communities are an amalgam of the so-called manosphere. Uh, these are men's rights activists who like to harass women, combined with, uh, we'll call them the red pill culture, right? So these are various gamers, anti-Semites, neo-Nazis, conservative nationalists, race realists, and in the United States type, because we have so many guns, um, militia types, who share messages and then intentionally spread them out to bring people into their fora. Um, there's also evidence that lies and misinformation spread faster online. A team of researchers assessed 126,000 tweets written between 2006 and 2017, and they found that true news stories take six times longer to reach people than disinformation. And this has nothing to do with algorithms. This is because people, we share the false news more readily. And why is this? Because false information, it's unique. It's novel. It has a certain value to us. And we like to share things that are valuable. We like to do it to demonstrate that we are the owners of unique and valuable information, right? So we are actually responsible for the spread of disinformation and information related to hate, no matter how vulgar it might be. So well, I'll just move on. You get the point. Um, add to this the fact that the online world allows, uh, next slide please, allows less radical people more opportunities to engage with more radical content. Um, in part, this is because extremists are much better at reaching groups than we are. Far-right extremists were among the first groups to adapt or adopt online technologies for their use. As early as 1984, right, when I was still playing with Lego, the Aryan Nation Liberty Net, a bulletin board system that used a very early version of the internet, had already created online communities to spread Holocaust denial, anti-Semitic literature, and to propagandize and recruit for neo-Nazi events in the United States. In short, these groups have been online longer than most of us have even known about the internet. We are playing catch up in a very real way. And the, they've led to the creation of a wide range of subcultures that are attracting young people. We all know from other historical periods that the creation of a well, heroes and martyrs for a, for a movement are an excellent way to recruit people, right? And the old heroes of right-wing movements of the past, like Hitler or Mussolini or others, 
they haven't gone exactly by the wayside, but they have become less relevant for youth today. Um, some right-wing groups instead are treating terrorists like Brenton Tarrant, indicated here on the left, the Christchurch New Zealand shooter, John Ernest, the shooter of the Poway Synagogue sh uh, shooting, Patrick Crucius from the El Paso, Texas Walmart shooting, uh, or Anders Breivik, the Norwegian shooter, as heroes, saints, or even Christ-like figures in a variety of online fora. And these are very easy to access even today. For more on this, there are two very good researchers, uh, Ari Ben-Am and Gabriel Weinman, who've done some work there. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna start wrapping it up because another factor and one I wanna go into a little more detail on is the rise of distortion and denial of the Holocaust. So what am I talking about here? If you could click twice, please. The Holocaust denial, one more click, thank you. Holocaust denial is somewhat easy to understand. Holocaust deniers try to convince us that the Holocaust did not happen, uh, and sometimes related atrocities as well, but primarily the Holocaust. In doing so, Holocaust deniers really only have one of two goals, to make anti-Semitism acceptable or to rehabilitate Nazism. This means that Holocaust denial is anti-Semitism, full stop. It is a problem, but it's also a less significant problem in our parts of the world today, uh, if you could click one more time for me, please, than the related problem of Holocaust distortion. Holocaust distortion is an attempt to excuse, minimize, or otherwise misrepresent the Holocaust, both as something historical or as something that has relevance today, okay? And it's tricky because it doesn't deny the reality of the Holocaust per se, it's also difficult to identify the motives behind distortion. Is somebody distorting the Holocaust because they're a cynical anti-Semite or are they just an idiot, right? It's really hard to say, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because if you allow for or excuse Holocaust distortion, well, think of it this way. On a moral level, Holocaust distortion is an insult to the memories of victims and survivors of the Holocaust. And on a practical level, there's enough evidence to show that it can act as a gateway to Holocaust denial, to conspiracy theory, and to more dangerous forms of anti-Semitism. So we must confront it. Let me just point out a few of the basic forms. Uh, click, please. Older forms of distortion and denial would play hap Sorry, there's gonna be a lot of animations here, so I apologize. Older forms of Holocaust distortion and denial would play havoc with the history of the Holocaust. Oftentimes these were easy enough to counter with scholarly research or archival documentation. Uh, click, please. Uh, we also see regular, oh, a couple of clicks. Uh, one more, there we go. Um, regular attempts to suggest that the Holocaust was either not an important part of national history or that locals did not play a role in crimes against Jews. This is the case of a memorial that's in Budapest. Uh, one more click. There are occasionally attempts to make the Holocaust seem somehow humorous or to suggest that it had positive aspects, uh, click please. I'm gonna have to get you a drink after all this for all the clicks, I really appreciate it, thank you. Um, blaming Jews for the Holocaust is something that we've seen become very common in a number of countries. Now this can take one of two forms. There are some people who will say that there's something in the Jewish character that led to the Holocaust, the older anti-Semitic themes typically. Um, there are also in a number of Eastern European countries offhand references to Judeo-communism. Now, depending on how this term is used, it's often a coded suggestion that the Holocaust was just an anti-communist action because they believe that Jews were overwhelmingly communist, something the statistics actually don't bear out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, State-sponsored distortion of the Holocaust is also increasingly common. Sometimes it can be innocuous, like this museum in Vienna that put up uh, Nazi imagery without any historical context. Uh, if you could click, please. And sometimes it can be much more overt. Oh, there, oh go back, there we go. Um, so this was from 2014 before the Russian Federation took over Crimea. This sign appeared in Crimea uh, and it essentially told the people of Crimea they had two choices, rule by the Nazis in a less than subtle reference to Ukraine or peace under the Russian Federation. Now, rhetoric like this has only grown in intensity since 2014, and we've seen it most prominently displayed over the course of the past week and a half 
after the Russian president claimed cynically that he was ordering the invasion of Ukraine in order to denazify that country. Next slide. There are also attempts even today, oh good, the animation works, to honor people whose actions or words helped lead to the crimes of the Holocaust. In short, to create new heroes out of the villains of the past. Uh, sometimes these rehabilitated individuals have benefit from uh, official actions like a court overturning a long past judicial sentence. So it might be interesting to this group to know the picture on the top right, sorry, top left, the individual on the far left, that was, that's Leon Rupnik. Now Rupnik was in charge of Ljubljana during the war. He was captured, tried and hanged in 1946. In January of 2020, the Supreme Court of Slovenia overturned his death sentence on a technicality. He's still dead. But by overturning that death sentence, it opens the door for him to be seen as legitimate in the pantheon of heroes by some segments of Slovenian society. I know that there are efforts in Slovenia to address this uh, in other ways to fix the problem. Other times, parliaments have gotten involved before the courts can even intervene. This is something we've seen most prominently in Ukraine and in Lithuania, for example. So in Ukraine, a uh, picture with, surrounded by grass, the statue with the, the head. That's a statue of Roman Shukevich. Uh, for who, those who do not know, Shukevich was a leader in the Ukrainian insurgent army who was not only complicit in crimes against Jews, but in the murders of about 90,000 ethnic Poles in Bohemia. Uh, he's been officially rehabilitated by the Rada and was a long time ago. And they just named a football stadium after him in Tirnopil about six, seven months ago. Um, sometimes those complicit in certain crimes of the Holocaust era underwent cultural rehabilitation, like the like Joseph Nero in the far left there, because they were well-known writers or other form of luminary. Some are venerated and protected by religious authorities, a matter that really complicates matters. And then there are some who escaped justice entirely and went on to fame after the war. To this, I want to draw your attention to the picture on the bottom right. Oh, and the group picture on the center there. So the group picture is a group of Nazi scientists brought to the United States to work on our rocket program. The statue on the bottom right is a statue for Van Herr von Braun, one of the heads of that program who helped get us to the moon. Some of these men, and von Braun in particular, were members of the SS and used programs that, o that or oversaw programs that made use of Jewish slave labor during the Holocaust. But they've been lionized for their efforts after the war, something that also proves that this is not just a problem of perpetrator countries or countries like your own that were occupied or countries that were neutral during the war or countries that were on the side of the allies of the United States and the Soviet Union. This is a shared problem that all of us have and that we all must work together to confront. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's move to the next slide. Repurposing Holocaust or Nazi imagery is also a very common form of distortion, and sometimes it's not very subtle. So this is the flag of uh, the Greek Golden Dawn Party. It's quite clear what they were inspired by, despite rhetoric to the contrary. Uh, click, please. There are going to be several clicks in this one. So... And if you knew that, for, oh, yeah, that's fine. You can keep them all up. That's good. All right. I would stop there. Um, all right. Top left flag. That is the flag of the All-German Heathens Front, a neo-Nazi organization based in Northern Europe. And if you knew that flag, you might recognize the one on the top right. That's the flag of the Nordic Resistance Movement, a different neo-Nazi band in Scandinavia that also likes to use runic symbols. But then things get tricky, right? Bottom left, that's a group of American white nationalists, including some of the planners of that Charlottesville rally I mentioned earlier. What are they holding? Does anybody know? Right. That's the flag of the Romanian Iron Guard, the neo-Nazi and fascist organization of Romania that existed between 1927 and 1941. Now, I'm a Holocaust specialist, and I didn't recognize that right away, right? But even if you know what you're looking at, Sometimes symbols can be hidden. So the flag on the bottom right, that is, I don't know how many fans of Polish football there are here. That is the shield in the center is fine. That's the shield for Legia Warszawa, the football team in Warsaw. Um, if you could click, please. I want to draw your attention to those triangles in the back. Those are not part of the team kit. Those are a so-called Volksangel, uh, a symbol used by some SS detachments in the 1940s. 
So sometimes these symbols can be staring you right in the face. So we're going to wrap it up now. What can we do? Uh, next slide, please. You can just click for until these four points come up. Things are bad. I really don't want to minimize this, but there are also some signs of progress. There are entire communities at both the grassroots and governmental levels trying to deal with these issues, talking about the problem, working cooperatively to find solutions. Just last year, there were a number of intergovernmental uh, gatherings, including gatherings attended by the Serbian government, uh, that are trying to deal with rising anti-Semitism in new ways. One of these took place uh, in Malmo, Sw uh, Sweden in October. There was another one in Israel. And in the EU, they launched an EU-wide action plan on anti-Semitism in November. But there's a lot more work to do. I'm going to give four suggestions on how to move ahead. First and foremost, we have to enhance educational opportunities to learn, and not just about the Holocaust, although the Holocaust is an essential component of this. We need to learn about the wider range of Jewish experiences and how Jews have contributed to our politics, to our cultures, to our societies, because it's still shamefully all too common to hear educators and policymakers refer to events like the Holocaust as Jewish history instead of something that we all share. And if we don't connect these experiences, that void will continue to be filled by imagined communities built on tension and hatred instead of harmony. And as we integrate this shared history, we also need to remember that education does not only occur in secondary school. Secondary education is an important foundation, don't get me wrong, but how many of us remember everything when we were 15 years old? I had two years of ancient Greek, I don't remember any of it, right? much less something that I only learned for a week. You need to continue to engage with these subjects in our universities, in our trade schools, in the training of our civil servants, and in other learning environments. Politics is also, unfortunately, essential. As hinted at earlier, anti-Semitism and the Holocaust are often topics misused for all manner of political or ideological ends. We need to speak out against this and not allow the Holocaust Jewish issues, the fight against hatred, and other issue, related matters to become a weapon that one political opponent uses against another when there's no reason to do so. Now, on the new media side, I was hinting at this earlier. There's a lot of talk about the need for online companies to take seriously their responsibility to curb hatred on their platforms. It's fine. I have no problem with that. I think it's good. It's only half the problem. What's the other half of the problem? It's us. We're the ones using this. You know, I have Twitter and t Telegram and TikTok and everything else. I need to learn how to communicate better. We need to learn how to communicate better because we're going to be using these platforms after all. And there's enough evidence to suggest that those who are sowing hatred and discord are much better at reaching vulnerable groups than we are. Finally, we need to develop opportunities for dialogue between like-minded causes. Anti-Semitism does not exist in an environment of its own making. It does not exist under a jar, and neither do other forms of hatred. There are clear distinctions between different types of hate and bias. Yes, we need to respect those. We should not lump everything into a generic fight against racism. But we also need to recognize that at times, various forms of hatred and bias intersect and overlap with one another. And if we don't begin working together across these lines, we're all going to continue to fall into decline. Now, the likelihood that we're going to achieve these goals, one last click and I swear you're done. Um, the likelihood we will achieve these goals is still uncertain. International and domestic cooperation is essential. Now, institutions like my home institution, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, we have some existing resources that can help you. Yet we're part of the US government, but we're also an international institution. We are there for you to use. We make available hundreds of educational resources, thousands of hours of film, millions of pages of books, and quite literally hundreds of millions of pages of archival materials, all for the purposes of education, research, and commemoration on some of these court subjects. We are your resource, and I encourage you to build relationships with us. But I also encourage you to work at the local level. 
work with local NGOs, work with local universities, and work with government structures. There is an opening I see right now to engage at least with the legacy of the Holocaust in this country. Utilize those, push forward for the future, and you have to do so cooperatively. And with that, I thank you for your time. I really thank you for all of the clicks and uh, happy to take any questions or just have a good chat. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your um, um, presentation. Now we have, I think, 15, 20 minutes for the QA and A session. So if you have, have any questions, please. Um, I'm just interested um, because I'm not a football fan, but um, the Polish club, for example. Um, is there a chance that this is just a very big coincidence? Hmm. Or, or are you like 100% sure that's that? The research indicates that it's not a coincidence and that okay. it's quite intentional. We've seen this with a number of football clubs. Um, a couple in Poland, a, a number of football clubs in Italy uh, have, have trafficked in this. Uh, some clubs in North Macedonia uh, have intentionally created symbols that kind of evoke, in the North Macedonian case, uh, the swastika. Um, this is part and parcel with some of the ultra cultures at some football clubs in different parts of Europe. I mean, it's not just a Polish problem by far. It's really, it's uh, almost shared problem with the exception of in a few countries. That's why there have been so many efforts to have FIFA or UEFA, you know, this various stamp out the hate campaigns uh, have, have worked with limited effect. In the case of, well, the biggest league, the Premier League, um, clubs like Chelsea have made self-conscious efforts to not only have moments of reflection on the legacy, Roma has too, actually, I know I think that, um, not only moments of reflection on things like the Holocaust or the problems of anti-Semitism, but actually train their fans in how to recognize anti-Semitism before coming into the stadium. So it's unfortunately, I don't think, a, a mistake. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, lecture. If you can do it briefly, I have two questions. But... You can also disregard one if it's, if it's too much. You have uh, the microphone. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, first question would be, do you have any comments about, the, let's say, anti-Semitism in uh, the, the Ottoman Empire? Mm. Because precisely, you know, after the expulsion from, from Spain and Portugal, Jewish community uh, expanded a lot during the Ottoman Empire. So it's still, you know, European continent, something relevant to, to this part of the world. Yep. And uh the other thing would be it might be a, a a more complicated question but i'll pose it anyway uh it's um you uh, if anti-semitism is a perception mm -hmm. and you proposed a number of things that could be done to counter this perception okay and you also showed that this uh, uh, anti-semitism is in a way on the rise, okay? So these are things. Um, in altering this perception, it seems that everything that we saw, that we can do, is on the, let's say, non-Jewish part of the world, mm -hmm. okay? That uh, Jews in themselves are totally neutral to, the, to, to this perception. And I wonder, uh, is that the case, like, do actions of Israel as a country mm -hmm. can have a detrimental influence to uh, perception of Jews in general and contribute to anti-Semitism? Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the Ottoman question because that's the easier one for me to answer. I am not a specialist in that. And uh, so what I do know uh, is that not just uh, Jews, but Christians were accorded a somewhat protected, but nevertheless second class citizen status under the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that um, informed certain cases of 
ostracization, depending on the time and place under, under Ottoman rule for Jewish communities, as well as for Christian communities at the time. There were differences in the ways that the two were treated, of course, but um, you know there were certain forms of anti-Semitism that existed, but it, it, it manifests as a lack of opportunity. That has changed and led to certain different dynamics in certain parts of the former Ottoman Empire today uh, around the issue of um, uh, crypto Jews. I can't remember the, uh, the Turkish term for it. Um, but, you know, this notion that there are individuals who whose ancestors might have been Jewish and therefore they can't pr be properly trusted uh, because they haven't fully converted over. These Domini. have led. Yeah, Domini. Domini. Thank you. This has led to certain conspiracy theories being directed at certain prominent families in cities like Thess Thessaloniki, as well as claims of conspiracies directed at, among others, Erdogan. So, you know, there are these, these legacies of the Ottomans that, that do manifest in strange anti-Semitic ways, but I'm, I'm really certainly not a specialist there. Okay, can the actions of Israel contribute to rising anti-Semitism? I think it's it's a difficult question to answer because it depends on <sighs> motivation is not the right word. OK, I'll, I'll put it this way. I am half Italian. Right. And am I should I or my mother be targeted uh, every time somebody like, I don't know, Silvio Berlusconi is in charge of, of, of Italy. Right. No, because I'm part of a diaspora community. The same applies to Jews who live in the diaspora when Israel is engaging in policies that the rest of the world may not think are appropriate at a given time. That, that should not mean that Israeli citizens at large are targeted or uh, non-Israeli Jews in the diaspora should not be targeted because there's a perception of something happening in the state of Israel. There are legitimate causes to be concerned with Israeli action, just as there are legitimate causes to be concerned with the actions of any country, uh, particularly countries that are in conflict. But that does not mean that the citizens uh, of that country on an everyday per individual level or persons who are part of a diaspora that may or may not have any attachment to that country should be targeted. That's why actually I use the case of the Wuppertal Synagogue. Um, and it's important to remember, and the reason I frame my understanding of this, it's not just because I'm not Jewish myself. The problem of anti-Semitism is something that non-Jews have created. That's why it's, it's necessary for non-Jews to understand it and for non-Jews to develop resources to counter anti-Semitism, or approaches to counter anti-Semitism. And it's not, to me at least, it seems ethically dubious to say to the persons who are being subject to the hatred to change their behavior or their perceived behavior to limit the hatred being directed their way. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, I think it's, you can't, it's, it falls under the victim blaming side of things. Um, hello, thank you for your lecture. It was very excellent and very informing. I have a question uh, that uh, basically related to the postmodernist era. Hmm. Actually, so Rory Elmans published one internet article some time ago, okay. basically comparing the rationale behind, behind Holocaust denial and postmodernism. Mm -hmm. Not equating them, but just saying that both of those strands of thoughts or whatever intentions are predicated on theory and then you mm -hmm. take certain facts, certain facts you just ignore, right. do the cherry picking basically. Yep. So your thoughts on relation between the, let's say, the Holocaust denial, distortion and postmodernist era that we are all living because mm -hmm. the, there are um, examples even in academia which are, you know, they're postmodernist authors, but you can see that they're basically cherry picking the, sure. the facts. So, yeah. Well, no, thank you. Don't tell Rory I said this. I haven't read that article, but I think I know what you're, you're getting at. Okay. Yes, I think it's clear that there are maybe not direct relationships, but indirect relationships between the rise of, I, I, let's call it the post-truth era that we live in. Because it's not just Holocaust denial. We live in an environment where people 
deny basic science. I mean, we have people who claim the earth is flat once again, for goodness sake, right? Um, so, you know, there's a climate of what some people are calling denialism anyway. And there are degrees to which it has been informed by a desire either at, we'll call it the intellectual level, the post-Foucault intellectual level, um, or the cynical political level to begin to cherry pick facts in order to create a reality that is comfortable for you, uh, to, to create a convenient truth to steal from the Al Gore documentaries. Name. And so I think there is there's certainly this aspect to it. I don't know how, it depends on the individual and in the moment, I don't know how intentional it is. I think part of it is not to pull up my phone again, but due to the very volume of information that we're receiving, right? If you, we are constantly being barraged with one news item after one, another after another, thousands every second. So how are we going to be able to construct a reality in such a mediatic environment in a way that is, I don't know, uh, conducive enough for us to understand the world as it actually is? I think there's a whole host of issues that are played into this, but I do think you know, the post-truth, post-modernist aspects are certainly at play here. Is there one from the back? Uh, I have a, a, yeah. a question. Um, I would like to go back to the, to the uh, briefly to the definition of the, of the IRA ah. about anti-Semitism. I was wondering, uh, you know, uh, you, you told us that um, many countries in Europe adopted this, 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 this uh, definition. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Yeah. I mean, what does it mean? Yeah. Well, it depends on the country. I, I will admit, and you'll probably get me in trouble if this is being recorded. I, I have a feeling that a number of countries have adopted it in order to have a checkbox to say, I've done the right thing, leave me alone. Um, but there are some countries who have adopted it and begun to integrate it into various educational programs or into in various programs to track certain forms of anti-Semitism. So one of your neighboring countries, Romania, for example, has used, and they were one of the first countries to actually adopt the definition. They also are responsible for passing the IRA. They were in charge of the IRA that year. They have integrated into a variety of training programs for civil service cadre so that it can become an educational resource on that level. The British have done the same sort of thing. And there are some people using it in certain second, we'll call them secondary and other educational environments to teach people about certain forms of anti-Semitism. But you bring up a good point. You can, there are all manner of legal codes and, and non-legal codes and definitions that have been adopted and then just sit fallow. I, I mentioned earlier, I'm from the state of Kentucky. There's a law in my home state that you can't walk with an ice cream cone in your back pocket uh, because somebody happened to put it on the law books in the 1800s and hasn't taken it off. It's never been enforced. You don't want these definitions to be inert. And so if you just adopt it to adopt it, you're really not helping. The definition is only a step in a much longer process of educating people about anti-Semitism. Okay, the major speaker. Okay, if, if there are not any questions, I think that we can say another, another time for another time. Thank you, Thank you for being here, and I hope that we will, I'm sure that we will organize other discussions, and I hope that you will be here uh, for another time in Belgrade, I and that so. we can organize here at the Institute another discussion with you. And with, with the, of course, the, with the museum. Thank you. Thank you. Hvala, Hunor, ste došli.